Again, we're teaching from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, reading from New King James Translation. And today we're finishing studying up, finally, the interactions of Jesus with the woman at the well in Sychar of Samaria. I thought it would be a week, and it's been, what, three weeks, maybe? <laughs> but we'll read, um, <clears throat> we'll read through verse 42. We read through verse 42 last time, but we only got to verse 38. So I'll pick it up at verse 39 and uh, see the results of this unlikely exchange between uh, God's Messiah and a Samaritan woman. The Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 39. And the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me everything, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So, he went, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. Now we've already related a lot of the elements of this account, and we know that many of the people that came out from Sychar, from the woman, many people did come out from, from Sychar, the town, uh, where the woman went and started telling everybody about what Jesus had done for her. And we saw that uh, so many people believed that woman from at the well because she testified about Jesus. So um, we're, we're seeing people now, I mean, earlier we saw people coming to faith in talking to Jesus. Now we're seeing people that are believing just because someone testified about him. So kind of, kind of exciting. At this point, they have not heard Jesus talk yet, have not heard his direct words. They haven't seen any of the signs that he's done uh, for them. Uh, nobody's given them a copy of the uh, Gospel of John or a, or a tract. <laughs> uh, they hadn't been to any Bible studies. Uh, hadn't even been an evangelistic crusade come through Sychar or, or any of Samaria at that point. Not even Nablus up the road there. But <laughs> you know, they're believing in Jesus. Doesn't that tell you something about how powerful your testimony is and my testimony <clears throat> is about what Jesus has been doing in, in my life and in your life? Um, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, it begins with an account of a wild man uh, possessed by many demons, causing all kinds of trouble in the area. And Jesus ministered to him and began to get in the boat to leave. When, when Jesus got ready to leave, the man literally begged Jesus to allow him to go with him. In Mark 5, 19 to 20, it says, However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis, the ten cities, all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. So his testimony is awesome. Just like with the former, formerly demon-possessed man, we continue to see fruit just from the testimony of this woman. Our life lesson right off the bat here is the same as what we had last week, very similar. You never know the effect your personal testimony has, but it will always direct people to Jesus. You never know the effect your personal testimony might have, but it will always direct people to Jesus. We don't realize our power in our testimony, and sometimes we don't really think it'll make a difference. I mean, honestly, you ever you know, say something and you think, they didn't care. They don't care. It doesn't make any difference. Trust me, it will make a difference. God will use that. We have to trust God's word in that. God says it'll make a difference. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says they overcame him, who? The enemy, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So that's a very powerful part of, of, uh, of ministry. Now, as we finished studying the second chapter, we, we looked back uh, a couple of chapters ago, we looked at uh, various levels of faith. And I'd like to encourage you to review that and review view the details. But the first two levels were, uh, number one, our faith is based on real historical events. And that would include the testimony of another person. And number two, our faith is personal. 
It applies to the reality of our lives. Our faith, our belief depends on getting to know more about Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, your faith grows. The first step, more about him. When you testify about what Jesus has done in your life, it's often the first step in someone else coming to him. Again, verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified he did, he told me all that I ever did. Now, I'm uh, quite connected electronically. I have way too many of these devices on me and around me. Um, too much so, in fact, when I, <laughs> when I top off my tank of gas or stop at a restaurant to eat or even run into a Dollar Tree for a bottle of water, uh, my, my phone deans and ask me to rate my experience and give a review. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, but even Google has figured out that the presence of a personal testimony is powerful enough to influence people in just about every aspect of life. Of course, they make money off of it. The more people that, that give that personal testimony, the more powerful that personal witness, personal review, personal testimony uh, is. Now, say what you want about Google, but are we Christians as smart as Google? Okay, give your testimony out to as many people as you can. Sometimes you may have a few minutes to chat with somebody or longer. You can share a cool story of how your life used to be and how you came to Jesus and how he's helped you since then. Sometimes you might have 30 seconds or a minute to give a testimony when you feel that. And I really encourage you to, uh, to practice, to, to come up with, you might have to write it down, depends on your personality and your, your spontaneity. But make a 30 second version of your testimony, maybe several 30 second versions uh, for different situations and, and practice it so that you're ready to give an answer to somebody when, when a situation comes up. It's kind of like planting, plowing the ground and sometimes it's planting the seeds with just a sentence or two. For instance, if a, a person is going through a health challenge and doesn't know what the cause is, you know, I might share with them, you know, four or five months, I was having some increasing pain down my legs and, and my feet and, and the doctors I was going to couldn't figure it out. So I prayed and asked God to lead me to the right one and I didn't do anything else until I found the one he showed me. When I went to him, that doctor told me exactly what the problem was and the steps to go through to resolve it. I should have prayed the first time. I should have prayed at the beginning. How long did that take? Just a few seconds. But it, it's a personal testimony. It's true. Maybe it'll inspire someone else. Uh, another person one time told me about the awful nightmares they were having and, and how it just upset them so bad they didn't want to go to sleep. You know, the Lord reminded me, years ago, I used to have nightmares a lot. I would actually cry myself to sleep at night. And after I put my trust in Jesus, several years later, I realized I never had any more nightmares. And I didn't, I didn't cry myself to sleep at night. So, you know, something like that, just a short recollection of what the Lord has done for you, sharing with somebody else can be the catalyst to change their life. Um, and the, the, another reason that the personal testimony is so powerful is, you know, you might come across someone that says, oh, I don't believe the Bible. You know, I don't, I don't read books or I don't care about that book. They, they're not gonna you say, hey, you should read this book. It helps. They're not gonna read the book. If, if they think it's got something like a Bible in it <laughs> or Bible verses in it, if they don't really know God and trust God. Um, but it's very difficult for them to discount your own personal testimony that you give to them when you're standing there in front of them of how God's changed your life. So, you know, I, I will mention that if you have an opportunity to, to leave a tract or a booklet or a gospel, a portion of God's word, go ahead and do that. And maybe even a teaser in there. Um, I, I've heard, I've heard so many and I don't remember very many, but, uh, I, I like, you know, if I give someone a testament, I, I'll get out let them know that there's, there's a section here, uh, that tells you, you know, helps you figure out whether you want to go to heaven or not. I mean, does that make you think or not? You know, especially if you don't know, um, you know, there may be something they're going through in life and I'll tell them, you know, you know, I, I heard you talking to your friend over there, how someone else had let you down. There's, there's some passages here. It will help you when your friends fail you. So, you know, leave something from God's word with them. 
And, and, and the teaser is always good. It helps the witness along the way. Um, it takes from that step of the historical faith to the realm of personal faith and personal belief. Just increases that possibility of, of faith with the, the person you're, you're dealing with. Now in today's text, I, I, I like rabbit trails, but in today's text, we see the Samaritan woman not only gave her personal testimony, but what else did she do? She gave them a living copy of God's Word. I believe every copy of God's Word is living. I mean, what other book calls out to you? What other book speaks to you every time you open it up? The author is there every time you read it. But in this case, she gave them a living copy of God's Word, Jesus himself, and then said, come and see, and led them to him. Okay. Plus, she gave them an irresistible teaser that challenged their curiosity. He said, come. Bring him, bring, I'm going to take him to Jesus. Could this be the Christ? It's like, oh, there's something i got to figure out here. So um, she hadn't even been trained in, in how to use the four spiritual laws or, <laughs> or, you know, gone through the How to Share Jesus Without Fear book or, or any of those things. But she just naturally uh, did these things. It was beautiful. We already knew that she knew that he was a Christ. But wasn't it a great teaser to to Come check out the claims. Let's go to verse 40 in our text. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You know, when you find a good thing, you want to keep it. And when you find the truth, you want to hear as much as possible while you can. And so uh, we see what's happening here. Let's, let's take a, a moment and dig into the, the Samaritan woman's, uh, the Samaritan situation and ask you a few questions. Have you ever been told something and was assured that it was the truth, only later to find out it wasn't true at all? In other words, have you been deceived at some point? I see one person, oh, there's, two, there's a couple. Okay, I think we all have. <laughs> We've all been there. Um, it could have been childhood fantasies, you know, like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy, or, or it could have been something political this last year and the weird election we had. Um, I don't need to expand on that. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but it could have been promises about a job that you took. Uh, it could be a realm romantic relationship or, or maybe even a, a shiny car that was supposedly only driven by that little old lady to church on Sundays. Apparently through the Grand Canyon. <laughs> but our text, we're introduced to the most insidious type of deception on the planet. It's probably the most prevalent, and that is religious deception. We see this type of deception in literally thousands. There are literally thousands of different religions around the world. The Samaritans were confused about religion so much so that, that Jesus said they didn't even know what it is that they worshipped. That's a pretty powerful statement. They didn't even, you know, what are you worshiping? We don't know. Well, they didn't say that. They were deceived. They thought they were worshiping the true and living God. They had a, a corrupt copy of the Torah, uh, seemingly edited to, to make it fit with them better um, and, and the lifestyles that they had, had chosen, but they didn't even have the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, or at least didn't recognize them as being scriptures, as being holy. So, on a personal note again, what is your response to someone who's been deceived? How do you, when you hear that someone's spouting off something <laughs> or saying something or, or acting in a way you know they've been deceived? You know, when Israel returned from captivity in Babylon, the Samaritans actually offered to help build the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, after we've talked about that and all the things that went on, that's amazing. They had offered to help build the temple. Why? Because they wanted to learn how to worship the true and living God. But the Jewish leaders, now, I'm not going to go into all the details, but the Jewish leaders at that point, instead of allowing them and teaching them, they pretty much disowned them as family and let them, refused to let them help at all. They had intermarried, but they wanted to get back on track. But they said, no, can't do that. We're going to do it. So we see a very quick flip, and this is all recorded in the scriptures. They turned against 
those who were building the temple started attacking them, you know, and, and it was not a pretty scene. It was a mess. And even, you know, even leading up to recent history before Jesus, there was violence, there's destruction. Um, and at this time, again, we saw the Jews wouldn't even go near them. They, they wouldn't even, I mean, if someone went near them, if they found one of their friends had gone through Samaria, you know, it was like anathema to them. They were, you know, they were bad just because they'd gone through Samaria. Um, you know, what's wrong with my friend? You know, is he, is he gone heathen on us because he went through Samaria? He talked to a Samaritan woman. This is terrible. Um, anyway, I, I think that's why we see that the Samaritans did not accept most of the, the beautiful and fascinating books that we all have in our Bibles in, in the Hebrew canon. Um, you know, the prophecy, the poetry, uh, the historical books. They didn't accept those books. Uh, why? I think it's because they were turned, they were shunned. It's like, they, they don't, anyway, it, the question I have is, another question is, is that the response that God would have us to do? Does he de desire that the people who do have the truth just sit on it and let the rest of the planet go to hell? I don't think so. I mean, here's some, some verses right here. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Psalm 105, 1. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Proverbs eleven thirty. Then turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. That's Isaiah 45, 22. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. That's in Malachi 1.11. These and many, many other scriptures reveal God's plan of doing mighty works for his people, which was always to show the other nations the true and the living God. It tells us a lot about why God does good things for us and why God blesses us the way he does. Now, do you feel back in the deception. When you see someone that's been deceived, do you feel bad when you realize they've been deceived? You know, it's, it's bad enough when it happens, but it's even worse when someone who knows the truth refuses to guide them in the right way. Even worse when they just beat on them. But we can try to guide them in the right way. As we know, not everybody will accept that correction. You know, that's not... As, as, as you raise your kids, you teach them what's right. And once they're old enough, when you, when you understand that they understand, if they don't accept that, that's not your fault. Okay? But you still have done the right thing. You can still try. The woman at the, the, that met Jesus at the well did her best to try to help her own town. And from that, many believed through the power of her testimony. Uh, again, a, a life lesson is your testimony has the power to change lives today. Verse 41, and many more believe because of his own word. Okay, so we're going to the next stage. Her testimony helped change lives, but now many more are believing through his own word. Talking about Jesus' own word. And even though your testimony is literally enough to cause people to believe in Jesus, many more people will believe, and that belief will be strengthened when they hear the words of Jesus himself. They even told the woman, after they'd been with Jesus for a couple of days, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. We ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They'd already believed, but now their faith was stronger and more sure, and more people came to him because they heard the words of Jesus. Now, <laughs> y'all ever read something and, and then realize later, you didn't really read it? <laughs> When I first read this, I, I thought their stronger belief came from meeting Jesus in person. I, he was there for two days. I mean, wouldn't it be great if each of us could, could bring our loved ones and friends and, and even strangers personally to Jesus so that they can know him? Well, I, I, I had to go back and read it again because I wasn't paying attention. It doesn't say we saw him or we met him and we know that this is indeed the Christ. No, it says, we heard him. They heard the word of God. 
they heard Jesus teaching them how to worship, the very thing their ancestors had wanted to learn hundreds of years earlier. And he taught them with his words, just the way he teaches us today through the scriptures. And they truly believed. Romans 10, 17, in the Tree of Life version, kind of a cool version, um, says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. Uh, recognize that as, uh, in other words, hearing by the word of God. Same thing, <laughs> Messiah, Jesus, God. Our life lesson here is sharing the words of God is even more powerful than your personal testimony. So intentionally share both. Sharing the words of God is even more powerful than your personal testimony. Intentionally share both. The more people that hear the words of the Messiah, literally the word of God, the more people will believe, the stronger their belief will be. When the word of God is fresh and untainted, untainted by the word interpretations of man, um, and when it's not corrupted by that, uh, the religious people, now many times, I mean, I know the results are incredible. Many times I'll, I'll tell people as I'm sharing with them what the Bible says, you know, in, with a Bible in my hand, hopefully, many times. And, I, you know, I'll just say, you know, does it, which is more important? What I say or, you know, or I think or what you think or what even what my churches or your church believes or the words that God says. I've never had anybody says, well, my church is much more important than God. They don't do that. Oh, God. They always answer God's. And so that's why those words of God are so amazing. Um, the Samaritans at that time only revered a portion of God's word from the Torah. And even that what they did read at the time had been tainted. But um, they had experienced just a couple of days. Okay. After Jesus is laid there. Just a couple of days of hearing the word of God in its pure form. And their life change was incredible. What a, what a powerful word that God has for us. Later on, when the non-believing Jews were not receiving Jesus' teaching, Jesus said, He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. <laughs> um, the, the, that's... To, to me, that's just, that's just uh, so, such a contrast. Uh, the Samaritans, which was not supposed to be the godly people, were receiving God's word gladly, starting to follow, you know, starting to follow Jesus. And the Jews who knew who they worshiped were rejecting the words of God. What, what, how ironic. You know, that the Jews quite likely having heard in, in that verse how the Samaritans had heard Jesus' teachings, accepted and believed him, they wanted to, to insult Jesus. And, and in fact, we'll study in, uh, after a while in John 8, verse 48, it says, the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? <laughs> okay, being, being a, called a Samaritan was already an insult. And now they were felt they were doubling down by, by bringing to mind that how the Samaritans did hear and accept the teaching. And it's like, oh, you know, so you're a Samaritan now because, you know, they're with you now. Um, anyway, it's quite an interesting exchange. Um, wish I had time to go into it, but it's going to be way off topic. So jot down John chapter 8. Read all that happened in John chapter 8 in, in light of what happened here in Samaria. And... Um, I'll continue on in our, our verses. Verse 43, now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. Now that's the second time that the time frame of two days is mentioned. Um, I don't know what all the implications are. I know it's there for a purpose. Maybe, I'll, maybe it'll be revealed, revealed to me later, but I, I got to thinking about the time that was saved by Jesus and his disciples cutting through, taking a shortcut through Samaria. It was probably a day or so. may have been two days. Depends on how, how they were traveling. Uh, so we see that Jesus really was showing his disciples that it didn't take an awful lot of extra time to evangelize an entire town, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the Messiah to a region that had been wanting to know how to worship God for centuries. Our life lessons 
And what does it matter? Then this is an ancient land and an ancient place, ancient time. What does it matter for us? Our life lesson is that people are anxiously waiting to hear the good news about Jesus. Take advantage of every opportunity to do so. People are anxiously waiting to hear the good news about Jesus. Take advantage of every opportunity to do so. Now, we see Jesus and the disciples, they're heading directly to Galilee to, to teach some more. Verse 44 says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Um, I'm going to backtrack a bit. I, I talked about, person, about personally, physically meeting Jesus, and I, I thought about um, how, you know, what kind of influence that would have. But we know the people in Nazareth. We know Nazareth and the surrounding area was his own country. We know that people spent time with Jesus. They met him personally. They knew his family, but they were not, according to this verse, they were not as receptive to the gospel. They were not as receptive to the truth. Um, if you look on the map, it would not have been hard or long, just a little jot out of the way to go to Nazareth, to go back, see my hometown, see my family, you know, see my people, so to speak. But it says what? He went to Galilee. For a te Jesus himself testified a prophet has no honor in his own country. He was going there to teach. If people were not going to receive the teaching, he wasn't going to go and waste his time there. I mean, it's, I don't know if there's any other better, better way to put it. He knew. Now for us, we don't know. <laughs> but we've been told to go and proclaim the word of God. And so we go wherever he, he leads us to. Um, it's kind of sad to see really how insignificant um, Nazareth, his hometown, has become in ministry. I, I checked it out. It's like, okay, well, what's it doing today? Well, there's a larger Arab population in Nazareth than there is a Jewish population today. 69% of the population is, is uh, Arab. I mean, excuse me, is Muslim out of those Arabs, 30.9% 30, 30 is Christian, which means there's almost no Jewish pop, almost 0.1% Jewish, Hindu, you know, everything else, non-believers and anything. And the scene was much different though than Nazareth when, uh, when Jesus came into the region of Galilee. In verse 45, it says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. So uh, Jesus had apparently set up a ministry base in Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, quite a ways from his hometown, which is kind of west-southwest of Galilee. Now, the Synoptic Gospels have a few more details of the work uh, he did there, but not a lot. And, and uh, by the way, if you're reading through the Synoptic Gospels, uh, you, you'll come across Luke. He doesn't mention the Sea of Galilee. The good doctor calls it the Lake of Gennesaret. So if you're wondering, hey, how did this lake get here and Jesus didn't go there anywhere else? It's the same name. There's like five different names for the Sea of Galilee. So Lake of Gennesaret is what Luke calls it. Anyway, we see that the Galileans are really happy to receive him. And um, why? Because they'd seen what he'd done at the feast in Jerusalem. Remember when we, when we were going through there, the most public thing he did is cleared out the corruption from the temple. I think he had a cheerleader, <laughs> cheering crowd. It was, go Jesus, go Jesus. Or who is this man? I don't know, but you know, let's help him. <laughs> you know? uh, maybe he did. I wonder how he cleared out that 19 acre area uh, you know, in, in that day with, uh, by himself. But he may have had a lot of people helping him. I, I don't know. But uh, we see that now, I'm not drawing any present day parallels, but we, when we see corruption and evil in leadership, people are always happy to see it cleared out, okay? Not that there's ever any corruption or evil in our leadership that we have in our country, but those, there are always those in power that benefit from the corruption and, and seek revenge. And we'll see in a few more chapters how even the divine son of God is not <clears throat> immune from such blowback from people that are benefiting from, um, from corruption and from things being wrong, done wrong. So our life lesson for personally in our lives here is that some people will be glad you bring the good news and some will be mad at you. Bring the good news anyway. 
Some people will be glad to bring you the good news. You mean, some people will be glad you bring the good news and some will be mad at you. Bring the good news anyway. I had thought we would finish chapter four with the next passage and study out how the miraculous sign played a role in preparing people for the kingdom of God. However, as I continued putting things together in the end of this chapter, it flows naturally into the beginning of the next chapter. So I won't be here for another hour. <laughs> but as you know, the chapter and verse divisions were simply for reference. Don't, they don't always reflect the separation of stories or themes. So we look forward to getting into those things next time, uh, starting at verse 46 and hopefully into uh, chapter 5. And, but at this point, Jesus had, and their disciples have made it to their destination to start teaching and doing and for Jesus to do some more signs. Um, and, you know, there's signs, there's wonders, there's miracles. Um, I won't get into start getting into that. <laughs> but uh, there, there's very, uh, you know, Jesus doing things to let people know who he really is. And we've seen examples here um, in the first few chapters of John how to really lovingly and sometimes at the same time firmly interact with someone who needs the Lord, someone who needs to hear the word of God. And, and there's two simple keys to evangelizing that every one of us can do to produce huge, huge results. And you don't always have to be able to talk right either. <laughs> so what are those two things that produce huge results? Personal testimony, sharing the word of God. Personal testimony, sharing the word of God. Remember in the first, kind of look back, remember the first 18 verses of John, it was kind of an eloquent flyover of the gospel of John and what it would reveal. The next 16 verses there in chapter one included events that testified that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And since then we've seen some pivotal events serving as signs that showed people he was indeed the Messiah, interspersed with one account after another, of how uh, people came to Jesus in different places and under different circumstances and how Jesus handled each one in a unique and special way. At the same time, he's given us many examples of what to do, what not to do when approaching people and uh, when they approach us to, to bring them the good news. And we've seen lots of grace and truth and soon Jesus will be teaching more and more, having to balance out the grace that he's always shown as he has to also um, present some hard truths and the opposition will build to them. So uh, we've got, a, I think it's a great book. Every book of the Bible is a great one to learn from. Um, it was, as we we're getting ready to start the, the church um, meetings here, it was difficult for me to figure out exactly where to start. And I'm glad the Holy Spirit led us here to John. It's, a, it's been a great book. Um, I think it's been right on target for each one of us needs to learn, including me. Um, and I also, I'm, I'm seeing more and more how uh, when someone is uh, saying, where do I start in the Bible? A lot of times people will say, start in John, start in the book of John, because it has something for everyone uh, in there, and uh, it shows Jesus' heart in every circumstance. So remember, God does his work in his way and his timetable, and, and we just get to enjoy being a part of it. And I pray each one of us will be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit as he guides us. I hope you I believe everyone that's here has put their trust in him and I uh, hope you have and, I, and you're also increasing your uh, relationship with him day to day and ask God every day to fill you with his spirit to give you the power to do his work through you. So it's been good to be with you. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless y'all.